how do we retrieve data from an Oracle database? In relational databases, there is a language called SQL, or Structured Query Language. In some circles, SQL is termed SQL. There isn't any difference. How do we get data from the database? In Structured Query Language, we use a statement called the SELECT statement. Note. When data is retrieved from a relational database, what you effectively retrieve are sets of data. The original philosophy behind SQL was to retrieve chunks of data, groups of data, or sets of rows. The original philosophy is not to retrieve a single row or make an exact hit, like you would, for instance, in an object structure. However, SQL and relational databases have matured to the point where you can retrieve a single row or multiple rows. The way you retrieve a single row we will get into later on, but it's really not really any different to the select statement other than the fact that you execute filtering onto the original select statement. So you'd go to a file with a select statement, a table, you'd retrieve rows and you say, okay, out of all these rows, retrieve this particular row. Therefore, you get an individual row. Let's talk about the SELECT statement a little bit. What does the SELECT statement do? This is a very simple syntax diagram for the SELECT statement. All I'm doing is I'm going to say SELECT column expression or asterisk. Now what these brackets, the square bracket mistake, now what the square brackets mean is that optionally I can add any number column expression or asterisk. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but we'll get into that later on. A column is a column in a table. An expression is a calculation, if you like, a thing in parentheses, a thing in brackets that says, take this column, multiply it by 5, or take a part of the string in that column. Asterisk simply means retrieve all the columns from a table. And obviously, we look to select rows from a table. The schema part here, schema name within the square brackets means that schema dot is optional. It means I can retrieve data from a different schema from the one I'm logged in as. So if I'm logged in as system, I can go and select data from a table in concerts. So I would say select column, column, column from concerts dot act, for instance. As you can see from this diagram here, I have, for instance, a single schema table, the category table in the concert schema sitting in the Oracle database. I would execute a SELECT statement, which this is quite a complicated one for now, but we'll get onto that later, against the category table, and I would pull out some data. That's how the SELECT statement works. Very simple, actually. Here are two very simple example SELECT statements. SELECT star from category. Go to the category table and select all the data all the columns and all the rows from the category table and display it. The second one simply retrieves two of the columns. So we're retrieving the category ID and the name column and we're leaving out the parent column. Let's try those. We have already used the select statement quite extensively in these courses so far. What we're really going to do with the select statement is to discuss the various pieces of it and understand exactly how it all works. So let's look at those two examples. First of all, I want to do a very small amount of formatting to make sure I can see what's going on. I'm going to set wrap off, which, as you know, stops the lines wrapping from one line to the next. So it will be chopped off according to a line size. So I could go and set my line size as well. I could also set those two variables like this, where I do not have to repeat set command. Let's go and select star from category in the first example. In fact, these examples are listed, as you can see from here, in uppercase. The case really makes no difference. Select star from category. And there we have all my category records. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm now going to select category, ID, and name from category. 
One point which is very important to note. I just stated that case makes no difference. Well, it does in some ways and it doesn't in others. As far as typing in commands, it's no problem. The case is really irrelevant. Many Oracle texts use uppercase characters for everything. The reason why is this. Because when you store things in Oracle within the metadata, all the names of, for instance, your tables and your column names are all converted to uppercase automatically. Why this is? Consistency. Otherwise, just accept it. What you need to do when you look at metadata, for instance, if you were to select table name from user tables, you would notice that all the tables are uppercase. If you wanted to select star from user tables, where table name in the word act, if that was lowercase, you wouldn't actually get an error. But if we can get around all this truncation information, you would actually get no rows. Now, the reason why it's giving me all these truncation errors is because I've set the wrap. So let's set wrap on, because we don't want it truncated. And let's select, well, I'll tell you what we can do. We can actually go back to that previous command and simply mark it, copy it, and paste it. Now we won't get all the garbage coming out telling us that the row has been truncated. If I was to change that to uppercase, I would get all the details on that table. It doesn't look very nice, but the point's made. Remember, internally, metadata is automatically converted to uppercase. Aliasing. What is aliasing? An alias is like, in computer science, an alias is a, a second name for something, or if you, if you, you could call it a synonym. Not really. That could be confusing because there are synonyms used in Oracle to give different names to objects such as tables. An alias is like a, a second or shortened name for a table. In a select statement, it's used to mainly an alias is used in join statements. We will get on to join statements later. That's much more complicated. All I want to do is show you that you can select from a table with an alias such as x and then you can reference the columns in the select statement by that alias so you would say select x dot column comma x dot column from table dot x so if we go back to the original form of our select statement all we've done is we simply added a prefix to the column and then if you like a postfix or an alias to the table so this is how an alias select statement would look. Now, I've grayed out the WHERE clause with the conjunction of the AND because we don't really want to look at that yet. That's filtering that comes later. As you can see, all we're doing is we're saying select category.name, parent.name from category, 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 parent. As I said, aliasing is generally used for joining tables. We do have a join here because we're selecting two tables. It's actually the same table, category, category, but we're giving it two different aliases. So what we're actually doing is we're selecting from the same table twice. If you remember, the category table has a category ID and a parent ID, which means what we have in this table is we have categories and then we have subcategories as well. So what you have here is a self join. It means that you've got two different layers or hierarchies of data in this table. So effectively what you can do is you can select from this table twice and join the parent to its subcategories, which is exactly what the SQL statement is doing. So you'd select alias category from the first table in the from clause, dot name, and parent dot name, which is the second instance of category in the from clause, joining the table to itself. The actual join clause in Oracle's original SQL statement join format is in the where clause where you take the category parent ID, where you take the category parent ID and join it to the category ID. In other words, parent to child ID. 
this line here with the where clause is simply ensuring that we do not get blank parent values. In other words, we don't ever get the parent categories, we only get the child categories because obviously the parents don't have a parent, so they're not. Now let's go and run this simple example of aliasing in SQL Plus. What I've done is I've copied it into a notepad and I'm simply going to copy and paste it into SQL Plus. And here we go. What we have is the name of the category and then the name of the parent category. So you can see the alternative rock, country, folk, etc. are concerts, as in music. Baseball, basketball, is sports, ballet, dance, classical opera, arts and theatre, etc., etc. That's what I mean by parent category and subcategory. So let's go on. This is a more comprehensive version of the select statement syntax. Note, there is further syntax in the select statement. The full select statement syntax is enormous. We will get to that at a later stage. The parts we're really interested in at this stage are really just the select column expression from table. That's all we're interested in right now. Apart from the fact that an expression is a number or string calculator such as a number is, is a calculation between two numbers such as 1 times 2 or column times a value and a string calculator is obviously such as a substring take a part out of a string or replace something in a string you, you're basically doing an exercise on a column a subquery we will get on to subqueries later but you can put subqueries into select statements a subquery is really a query executed inside a query in other words a select statement executed within a select statement subqueries can go in all sorts of places all I'm trying to express here is that an expression can also be a subquery. In other words, select statements can be what in computer science we call nested. We have syntax for the WHERE clause here and for the order BY clause. The WHERE clause is used to filter. So, as I said before, we select all the data from the table. The WHERE clause is used to retrieve the records we want. In other words, filter out the records we don't want earlier I was alluding to how you would find a single record with SQL because SQL is really for retrieving groups of records, record sets. You could apply something in a WHERE clause that says go and select from a table, for instance the category, where a value is set to one particular thing and theoretically you could find a single record. Order by, the order by clause is simply sorting the output. So you would run the select the WHERE clause would be applied to filter the data and then the ORDER BY clause would be applied to the filtered data or rows and you would take those rows and order them in a certain fashion by columns, expressions, positions, etc. There's a lot of other syntax in there that we don't really have to worry about at this point. All I'm trying to do is show you a slightly more complex version of the select statement syntax to introduce it to you in small pieces. Now let's look at types of select statement. In my mind, I can divide up select statements into many different types. All these listed here. Simple query, filtered query, sorted query, join, subquery, table creation, view creation, hierarchical query. Take a breath, that's quite a few. Now let's go back to the start again. What is a simple query? In my mind, a simple query is quite simply put a select of all columns from a single table. So I'm going to go to my notepad and I'm going to copy and paste this simple query. I'm going to go to SQL Plus and I'm going to paste it in and run it. The simple query selects all columns from the category table. Let me show you a trick. Let's say I wanted to run that command again. I simply type the front slash which means Look at the last command in the buffer, the last SQL statement, and re-execute it. The one thing you can probably notice here is that the category table actually has three columns, category ID, name, and parent ID. I cannot see the parent ID because it's off the screen, and I've set wrap off, and I've set the line size to 132. I could wrap it. 
I could set wrap on again and I could once again select star from category and it would wrap around to the next row which doesn't appear to have done because what I've got to do is to set wrap on and paste it again and again the reason why is because line size is set to something nasty so let's go and set it to 40 and now we wrap so now we see the category name and parent ID that looks quite ugly what I generally tend to do is I use SQL plus for a lot of database administration a lot of testing a lot of experimentation for the purposes of this course I could be using SQL plus worksheet SQL plus worksheet is quite a lot friendlier in terms of showing the results let's clear this bottom window and let's execute this and here we have the wrapping set on and the line size so what we'll do is at the beginning of this we'll actually set wrap off and we'll set line size on the same line and we'll re-execute this command now what we should be able to do is to use the scroll bar to go across the point I'm trying to make here is that the SQL plus worksheet is quite a lot friendlier as in user friendly in terms of displaying data reporting it's more of an end user tool than SQL plus is now I'm in iSQL plus we have looked at SQL plus, SQL plus worksheet and iSQL plus for the purposes of displaying the output from SQL statements probably the best tool to use is iSQL plus it just looks so much nicer so let's scroll down here and here we have a listing of the category table now let's go on to the next one a filtered query what is a filtered query all a filtered query is doing is selecting from the table and then applying what's called a where clause it's filtering out data here I am selecting all rows that match a pattern of a and anything the percentage is a wild card so it's saying where a name is like a dot 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 whatever you like so let's execute our next SQL statement with the where filtering clause in iSQL plus and here we have two rows from the category table where their names start with A the next type of query a sorted query sorted means ordered in a certain fashion what we're going to do is we're going to sort this query by the name of the category so now back in iSQL plus we'll paste our sorted query and we'll execute it and we'll go down and we'll see AA, BB, etc, etc we have sorted it in the order of the name of the category note the category ID this is a sequence number the order in which they were generated would be the order of the numbers of the category ID so if we were to just list this table without the order clause it would be in a totally different order so let's execute that and demonstrate it as you can see this output is no longer in the order of the name field next a join query a join is literally a join or a merge between multiple tables in this case two tables note I have something down here that says new ANSI format it also says difficult to tune we'll get onto that in a minute the new ANSI format is from the American National Standards Institute which is more or less a non-profit organization which establishes standards for programming languages etc Oracle allows compliance with the ANSI format however most relational databases use SQL in their own proprietary format it's more or less very similar to this Oracle has certain tricks and tips which we'll look at later on which allow you to tune Oracle SQL statements very proactively the ANSI format because of the way it's structured from what I've seen lately in Oracle 9i could be possibly very difficult to tune at this stage these select statements are getting a little complicated and we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves so I'm not going to show you any more physical examples in SQL plus or SQL plus worksheet or iSQL plus at this point in time I'm just going to show you how they're structured 
and simply describe them very quickly. As we've already discussed, a subquery is a query executed within a query, or in many other ways. For instance, you can execute subqueries inside other types of data manipulation language, what Oracle calls DML query statements, such as insert statements, delete statements, update statements, many other places. The point is, it is a subset query executed inside some other piece of SQL code. Here is a subquery with the subquery placed within the columns of the select statement. This is a subquery expression as a column substitution within this select statement. This one is a subquery placed within the WHERE filtering clause. This one is a subquery placed within the FROM clause. And here's an example of a nested subquery. It's actually in the WHERE filtering clause where we select the primary or the main SQL statement selects from the ACT table where the ACT ID from the ACT table will be found within the ACT ID from the show table where the venue ID within the show table is found within the venue table. So the venue table selection is included within the show table selection which is included within the ACT table selection. These are all the places where you can use subqueries. As you can see, there are a lot of places that you can use them. We won't go into this in detail at this stage. A select statement can be used to create a table. As you can see, create table shows as a select statement. Same thing applies to a view. It's more or less exactly the same syntax, apart from the fact that it says create view as opposed to create table. A hierarchical query as it says here, establishes a relationship between parent and child tuples. A hierarchical query can be used to establish a relationship between parent and child rows or records or tuples within the same table. Let's talk about the dual table. What is the dual table? The dual table is effectively a dummy table. What I'd actually like to do is something which is not really included in the certification course, but to try to make an attempt to explaining why it exists. The reason stems from the way in which SQL works. What SQL does is it selects information from, for instance, a single table and comes back with many rows. The point is you have to select from a database object. This is the idea behind SQL. What happens sometimes is there's no table to select from. Therefore, what Oracle has is a dummy table called dual, which is more or less a repository, a temporary repository, or a t what's called a temporary cursor, if you like, where the information retrieved by the select statement is temporarily placed into the dual table and then passed back to the output, such as SQL plus, from the dual table, as being selected from the dual table. So let's go a little further with this. As it says here, every select statement creates an implicit cursor. What I want to do is more or less read off what is typed in on the screen here so that firstly you can refer back to this text, all these items. Secondly, so that you get a very explicit explanation of why the dual table exists. So every select statement creates an implicit cursor. Every time you execute any kind of SQL code against a relational database, it theoretically creates an implicit cursor. An implicit cursor is a chunk of memory. A cursor is an area in memory allocated for the results of a SQL statement. Think about it. You execute a SQL statement. It goes to a table. It builds what's called a cursor in a chunk of memory which contains the result of that SQL statement. Since, as we've already said, a select statement requires a source table for the implicit cursor to operate on, and some select statements do not retrieve from any particular table, that dual table becomes a repository for, if you like, an expression result applied to either a single value or a set of rows. The dual table acts as a temporary repository for the results of or the result of an expression a single expression or a cursor, the area of memory where the results of a table select are placed. 
the result of that expression is selected from the dual table. So quite simply put, the dual table is really a dummy object placed between input and output in order to cater for the way that SQL works. What would you use the dual table to do? You would use the dual table to retrieve oracle constants. A constant value is not stored in a table, but there are constants contained within Oracle that you can retrieve information from, such as the system date. You can also do a select statement that selects a single literal value from dual. You can't select that single literal value from a table because it doesn't exist in the table. The only thing that exists in the table are column names. You could also apply a constant value to every row. What I'd like to do is to try out these examples. So let's run the first query. Select star from dual. We find we come up with an X. That's the default value for the dual table when you simply select everything from the dual table. Let's take a quick look at the dual table. All it contains is a single bar chart column, which acts as a dummy repository for the results of a select statement. Now let's try the second example. Let's try select a dot star, b dot star from dual, alias is a, and the act table alias is b. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join the results of the act table, and for every row of the act table, I will get the response from the dual table, which as you can see is x. Now let's try the third example. The third example simply allows me to select a constant value from nowhere, from dual and all it does is returns that constant value. The fourth example selects from dual and it selects a constant value contained within the Oracle database, namely the sysdate. The sysdate is the system date or the current date on your machine. And here is the sysdate selection. As you can see, 15 January 03. Now let's take a step back and read through these items again just to make sure you understand exactly what the dual table does. Constant value functions. Here are various functions contained within Oracle that we can use to retrieve constant values from the Oracle database using dual. So we've already retrieved the sys date. Let's try and use sys time stem and see what we get. We actually get the date, but in a timestamp format with minutes, hours, seconds, AM or PM. This timestamp is actually minus eight hours GMT, which is specific standard time. Now let's look at the user constant value should tell me who I'm logged in as. Constance. The same applies to UID, which gives me a user ID for my current session. What is the meaning of the word null? Quite literally, null represents absolutely nothing at all. Null is not even a space character. And it's not the same as zero either. A null value is for instance, a column in a table that contains absolutely nothing. It does not contain a space character. It does not contain a zero. It contains nothing. Null is nothing. Effectively, what is in a table column with a null value is really just the column structure definition. There is no value in there at all. A few facts about nulls. Null values are not indexed. They're not included in indexes. Most functions when passed the null value, return a null, because there's nothing to operate on. You test for a null, for instance, in a filtering where clause on a select statement using the is null clause. The negative would be is not null. In other words, is a column null, or is it not null? If it contains a null, you want to see if it is null. If you want to find out if it does not contain a null, you ask if it is not null. Let's take a look at a few simple examples. We'll go to SQL Plus and we'll paste in a select statement, which selects two fields from the show table where the show date is null. There are 
rows in the show table which have a null show date. What's the result I get? I simply get the show ID with four rows from the show table with a show date which is empty. Let's try a second example. In this case, I'm going to add a value to the show date. Normally in Oracle what you can do is you can add a value to a date and you get, for instance, date plus five, you get whatever is contained within this date plus five dates. In this case, you get nothing because you cannot add a five to a null. If I was to type select sysdate plus five from dual, I would get today's date plus five. Since today's date on my machine at this point in time is 15th of January, 15th of January plus five days is 20th of January. In general, an expression containing a null will always return a null. As we saw in the previous example, where we selected show date plus five. The show date is null, add five to it, we get a null answer. There's a function in Oracle called NVL. What this does is allow you to replace a null value with a literal value, such as a zero or an empty string, or even any string you like, or even any string you would like to replace it with. Here's another example using the NVL function. In the previous example, I attempted to add five days to null value show dates, where show date is null. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the NVL function to the show date. If the show date is null, I'm going to replace the show date with the system date. I'm going to add five days to it. The result I get now is 20th of January. In order to demonstrate this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste the same query in, and I'm going to remove the where clause. So I will now get all the show records, including the show records with show dates that are null and those that are not null. I've added five days to every date. I could demonstrate that more clearly by changing the SQL statement, selecting the sys date, the show date, and then applying the null value replacement function to the show date using the sys date. So let's see what we get. I need to find my null values. Here's one. Show ID 27 gives me the 15th of January for my system date, which is today. It gives me a null show date. As you can see, what's happened is this date has been replaced by the system date plus five because there's no show date. In the case of the record above it, we've got today's date, and then we've got 30th of August, and it's added five days to the 30th of August, which is a non-null show date, and it's made of 4th of September. It's very important to note when sorting rows with a select statement, the null will always sort as the highest value. What does this mean? This means that when you select all rows, for instance, from the show table, if you were to order by the show date, the rows with the null valued show dates will appear right at the end. Let's demonstrate that. So let's select the show date from the show table and order it by the show date. We get four null records at the end. What this means is that, as far as Oracle is concerned, the null dates are the highest value date. There is some other way we can actually demonstrate this as well, using the clause called descending. We'll get into this later when we go into the details of the order by clause and sorting data, but all this does really is pulls out the show date and orders the results based on the show date in descending order. So the result is, is the null values are no longer at the end, but they're actually at the beginning because, as I said, they're the highest value. So if we go back to the beginning of this, we'll find four nulls at the beginning. That's how nulls behave in sorting data. Pseudo columns. 
In all the Oracle documentation, you will find pseudocolumns referred to as pseudocolumn without the hyphen. What is a pseudocolumn? The word pseudo means fake or pretend. In terms of Oracle, it's really a column which is not actually a column. Effectively, what it has underneath it is really a function or an internal function which converts one thing to another. Pseudo columns obviously do not contain constant values. It's not like sysdate, which contains the system date. The date is not actually a constant value because it changes, but as far as Oracle is concerned, when you hit the database and query it and ask for the sysdate, at that point in time, it's a constant value. The pseudo column values is calculated when you ask for it. It's not stored in the database as any specific value. In other words, they're generated on request. What are the types of pseudo columns in the Oracle database? There are a number of types. The first one I want to look at is sequences. Within a sequence, you can access the current value or the next value by two pseudo columns, one called current val, one called next val. One very important thing to note about current val and next val. When using current val in a session, to access the value of a sequence, you must have already executed next val. If you execute current val without next val first, you will get an error. Let's demonstrate that. First of all, let's go and look at our sequences. We're going to look at a view called user sequences. So we're looking at all the sequences in the constant user. I've used sequences for all the IDs, for instance, the ACT ID, the category ID, etc. Let's try and select ACT sequence dot current val, and it comes from dual since it's not coming from anywhere. Current val is not a table or an object. ACT sequences, but ACT sequence dot current val is not. Select current val, it says, is not yet defined for this session. So the only way I can do it is to select at sequence dot next val from dual. This will give me the next value for the sequence, and it will increment the sequence as well. And now what I can do is I can actually go and select the current value. That's what those two pseudo columns do. The row ID. A row ID is a logical pointer to a row in a table. What you can do, as we've seen on numerous occasions in this course so far, is you can select the row ID from the table. In this case, I selected the row ID and the name from the category table. The row ID is actually the fastest way to access an individual row in the database. The problem is you have to know what that row ID is first. The row ID is actually a logical structure made up of various pointers to various Oracle database structures. They are namely the identifier for a table space, a block within a data file, a row within that block, and a data file number within the table space. A table space can have multiple data files. What Oracle does is, for instance, when you have a table and an index, this would be the structure of an index on the name column on the category table. The index would contain the name value and a row ID, which is a pointer to the table. The table contains the row ID plus all the other columns in the category table, namely the category ID, the parent ID, and the name of the category. So the index would be searched based on the name. It's much smaller than the table. Theoretically, it's faster. It has fewer columns. Then the row ID would be used to access directly from the index directly to the exact physical pseudo-logical point of where the row is in the table. The row num pseudo column. The row num simply outputs a number or a sequence number in sequence of each row as it's retrieved from a select statement. Let's explain the row num by example. Let's take this query. We're going to select the row num and the name from the act table. And we're going to select the entire table. We find that the data is output with the row num and the name of the act. Note that the act name is not sorted. Now we're going to do the same thing and apply an order by clause on the act name field. 
Note that the numbers are now all jumbled up, although the name of the act is sorted alphabetically. Another example places a WHERE clause before the ORDER BY clause, which is where it should be, and we retrieve the first ten records. Note that the numbers are not sorted. This is because the ORDER BY was applied after the WHERE clause. So we could do the same thing, take out the ORDER BY, and we get rows in the row num order. Now what we can do is we can place the name from the ACT table sorted within a subquery and then select the row num from the query that calls the subquery within the FROM clause. Now we get the row num in the correct order. It's important to note that the row num WHERE clause in the previous query, namely this query is applied before the order by clause is applied. So actually what you're doing is you're selecting all the records, you're taking the first ten records and then you're reordering it. This is why the row numbers don't always come out in the right sequence. The level pseudo column. The level pseudo column is used within hierarchical queries to represent and access levels. I've really just drawn a diagram on the right here to show how the level would represent the level within a hierarchical tree structure. This diagram, if you can actually see the text, is a hierarchical tree structure for a syntactical lexicon of the English language. Simple word types. The blue circles represent level one in the tree. The red circles represent level 2 in the tree, and the cyan circles represent level 3. I haven't gone further down than that, but there are four levels in this tree. The XML data pseudo column. The XML data pseudo column allows access to XML types which contain XML documents. More about SQL Plus formatting. There are various things that you can do in general in SQL Plus, SQL Plus worksheet and iSQL Plus. There are variations between the three different tools, but they're slight and we won't worry about them at this point. You can set the environment, for one thing. You can run scripts in SQL Plus, either in SQL Plus itself, or within the other tools, or as a command line executed script. You can also create variables, set them, and reset them in SQL Plus. You can do things with for instance, headings on the output in SQL Plus. You can change them, you can change the content of the headings, you can override the default headings, which are the column headings. Let's look at the environment. The environment settings are determined by all settings that can be accessed by either the show or the set command. Now if you want to see what your environment settings are currently, you simply go to SQL Plus and type show all. We've seen some of these environmental settings before, such as rep set to op, line size set to 132. This is simply a listing of every single one that's available. Obviously, other than typing show all, I could type show rep for a specific setting, and it tells me exactly the setting of rep. It says lines will be truncated. If I were to set wrap on, and I show wrap again, it says lines will be wrapped. In other words, I select a lot of data, such as, for instance, star from show. It goes over the line. It wraps around the line. Unfortunately, that file is not big enough. Let's try select star from venue. There it's wrapped. Just to make a point, when I did select star from show, I could have actually forced some wrap in there by setting the line size, for instance, to 20 characters. And once again, selecting star from the show table, and it wraps for 20 characters. That's not very much use, though. So we've looked at the show and the set command. 
set command allows me to change the environmental settings the show command will show an individual value or all of the values this is a listing of some of the settings that I think are useful and interesting. Bear in mind, though, that I'm not writing reports in SQL Plus. It is unlikely that anyone will write reports in SQL Plus in the modern day, apart from the fact that iSQL Plus is quite good at writing usable reports into the browser. There are many highly sophisticated, highly graphically oriented end user reporting tools available. Some of them are expensive, some of them are very cheap, some of them are probably even free. So most of the commands I have listed here are really for doing SQL code testing, building SQL code statements, doing database administration. They're useful in that respect. Environmental settings. Setting echo off is used when running scripts that prevents echoes of commands being output to the screen. Escape allows the setting of escape characters. Feedback displays rows returned. Let's run this query. Now let's set feedback off and run the query again. See, we don't get nine rows selected at the end of it. Heading on or off. Let's set heading off and run our previous query once again. Now we have no headings. There are the headings. There, there are no headings. Line size we've already seen. Num format allows the application of formatting to numbers as they are output. Num width will set the width of the number. The default is 10 characters. Null string will replace any null values output with a string value. Page size sets the size of a page and determines when the breaks and titles are repeated. If you set it to zero, the headers will simply disappear. Let's do something with page size. First of all, we have to set the headings on again. And let's run that query again. There we have act and name. Now let's set our page size. First of all, let's see what page size is set to. It's set to 14. Let's set, since we're bringing out 10 rows in this query, we'll set page size to 5. And we'll run our query again. The number of lines on the page are one, two rows, plus two lines for the heading, plus a blank line. So we could set it to something a little more visually appealing. For instance, set it to 10, run the same query, and we can see that we've got blank, one, two, and then seven is 10, then it breaks. Another use for page size is, as we've seen in the previous diagram, is to set page size to zero, and it will completely switch off the page breaks. So if I were to select everything from ACT, as you can see, I have no page breaks, no headings, no page breaks. Server output switched on is used with DBMS output to display output in PLSQL code. That's a little bit advanced to demonstrate that in the moment, so we won't. SQL prompt will set the SQL prompt on and off. So let's show the SQL prompt. It's set to SQL, this thing here you can see here. So let's set SQL prompt to an empty string. As you can see, the SQL prompt has completely disappeared. Turnout suppresses screen output. Timing switches timing on and off. Let's show timing. Let's switch to off. Let's set timing on and run the same query. And it tells me that zero seconds elapsed. I would have to run a larger query in order to actually get a response. And there we have 0 0.02 seconds it took me to run that query. Verify will display variable substitution display. When a variable is accepted using accept into SQL plus, the line is displayed as the variable is replaced. You can switch that off. Word wrapping we already know. Spooling is important for scripting. Let's have a look at spooling. Firstly, I'm going to go and switch on all the things I've switched off so far. So I'm going to set head on. I'm going to set page size. 
to a sensible value. And I'm going to set SQL prompt to SQL. Looks like I spelt that wrong. So I'll copy this again. And I'll simply rerun it. Once again, we should have most of what we need. The one thing we haven't set back on is feedback. And I spelt that wrong too, but never mind, we can type it again. Now let's try again. And there we have it. Other than the fact that timing is still set on, so we can set timing off again. And we can select from the app table again and verify we don't get elapsed time popping up there. Spooling. To open a spool file, a spool file is basically a log trace. I'm going to open the spool file. I'm going to say C colon. In a temp directory, I'm going to say sql.log. That opens my file. Now I'm going to run a command. So I'm going to say select star from the act table. And I'm going to spool off. What I've done is I've gone to my C colon backslash temp directory where I created my spool file called sql.log. Let's open that file. Here is my file. It's basically a select statement duplicating the command plus the data. What I'm going to do now is to show you the use of the spool command and scripting. What I have here is a script file. In the script file, I open and close the spool file. At the end of the script file, I exit. I'm going to run this script in a DOS window, a DOS shell. Within this script, you can see I've set various environmental parameters. I switched off the SQL prompt. I switched off the headings with both page size and heading off, and I switched off feedback. I've also executed the select command as a concatenation of the ID number and the name. I'm going to run SQL plus minus silent to suppress all command repetitions. I'm going to log in as concerts to my database and I'm going to execute the script. And there it's executed. Now let's go and take a look at the file that we output, the SQL.log. You can see that I've got a comma as a break between the two field names, and I have no headings and no footers. This file could be used, for instance, to input into an Excel spreadsheet. So let's go and do that. Let's open up a spreadsheet in CTEMP and find my file. It's called SQL.log. I'm going to open it. Since it's a common delimited file, I'm going to delimit it with a comma, remove the text qualifiers, and here I have my data in a spreadsheet. That just gives you an example of what you can do with scripting. Variables can be set in SQL Plus using the define and undefined keywords. Headings can be set in SQL Plus, either as a replacement in the select statement, or we can set the columns specifically as seen in this syntax diagram. Let's try the first method of changing headings. Note that what we're doing is we're actually changing the column name. Since we're not changing the headings with the column syntax command, and the default headings are the column names. If we change the column name, obviously we change the header. So let's try select act ID as ID and name as act from the act table. This is what we get. We get the column header changed to ID and the name changed to act. 
effectively what we're doing is we're actually changing the column name. This is useful in advanced SQL statements when writing subqueries and passing values backwards and forwards in combination with aliases. It's also useful for the obvious changing the heading names. The column command actually allows us to change the format of columns, not just the name of the column and the heading of the column, but to apply, for instance, number formatting or character formatting to all those columns. So let's show some very simple examples using the column command. I'm pasting in from a notepad file, and I'm setting column values. I'm actually resetting the heading of the act ID column to identifier, and I'm setting the format on the number formatting for the act ID column to something kind of stupid, but all I'm trying to do is just demonstrate what it does. Generally, you use commas for thousands, so you generally have 999, 999, 999. Since my act IDs are not in the thousands, there are only about 50 of them, I want to just break each numeral in the number up by commas. It serves its purpose. I'm changing the name of the heading for the name column in the act table to act and I'm changing its format to A10. What that means is it's only going to output 10 characters, the first 10. So let's just quickly run from act. And you see we've only got 10 characters in the name column for the act. I've changed the headings and I've broken those up by commas. Now let's do something a little more sensible. Let's reset the format on the act ID to a sensible value, 10 nines, and let's set the name column in the act table to 25 characters. Note, setting this name column with a heading act and a format 25 will apply to all tables that I select from with a column called name. First of all, let's select star from act and we get 25 characters and the number in a sensible format and the headings changed to identify an act. Now let's go and select venue ID and name from venue. If I scroll up, I find that the venue ID is set to the default heading for this column, which is the name of the column, and the name of the venue is actually set to act. So what I'd have to do is to change the column name of name, or not the column name, but the, the heading for the column name, because I'm not changing the column name, and I would change that to venue. And I select once again, and we could use the front slash character to execute the previous SQL command, and we have the name changed to venue.